Lecture 40, Diathesis and Stress. Where does mental illness come from? The history of psychiatry and clinical psychology can be characterized as a kind of cycle in which prevailing views alternate between somatogenic and psychogenic theories of mental illness. Somatogenic theories hold that mental illness is due to biological causes, such as brain insult, injury, disease, something genetic, something hormonal. Psychogenic theories, by contrast, hold that mental illness is due to environmental causes, something about experience and learning. Over the past 100 years or so, biological causes have been uncovered for a number of mental illnesses. Alzheimer's disease, once labeled as pre-senile dementia, is now known to be caused by the plaques and tangles in brain tissue. According to the dopamine hypothesis of schizophrenia, the symptoms of schizophrenia and their underlying psychopathology are caused by excess activity of dopamine, an important neurotransmitter. And according to the monoamine hypothesis of depression, the symptoms of depression and their underlying psychopathology are caused by lower levels of another class of neurotransmitters, the monoamines, which include norepinephrine and serotonin. On the psychogenic side of the coin, post-traumatic stress disorder is caused almost by definition by exposure to traumatic levels of stress. We've seen how phobias can be thought of as fear responses and compulsions as avoidance responses acquired through a history of social learning. And there's a prominent theory that some forms of depression are related to learned helplessness caused by exposure to unpredictable and uncontrollable aversive events. The psychological deficits that feature so prominently in syndromes like schizophrenia, autism, some forms of depression, and even attention deficit disorder presumably have their deep origins in biology. Presumably, these illnesses are fundamentally somatogenic in nature. But the symptoms we see in phobias, obsessive compulsive disorder, other forms of depression, and the psychophysiological disorders seem to have their origins in an experience of maladaptive social learning. So instead of having somatogenic or psychogenic theories of mental illness in general, what we really want to be thinking of are somatogenic or psychogenic theories of particular forms of mental illness. The somatogenic and psychogenic theories of mental illness are first and foremost theories about the role of nature and nurture. And what we've now learned is that the proper formulation of this question is not which is right, but rather how do nature and nurture interact? The etiology of mental illness is no exception to this rule. In fact, the dominant framework for thinking about the origins of psychopathology is what's known as the diathesis stress model of psychopathology. According to the model, a diathesis represents a predisposition toward a specific breakdown in normal mental functioning. Its source may lie in the person's biological endowment, experiential history of social learning, or both. In either case, the diathesis renders the person vulnerable to, or at risk for, some specific form of psychopathology. Every person achieves a more or less successful adaptation to this genetic or psychosocial heritage. Stress refers to any event, or perhaps a series of events, which challenges the person's current level of adaptation to his or her diathesis. And again, these stress factors may be either biological or psychosocial in nature. The interaction of diathesis and stress precipitate an acute episode of mental illness, what used to be called, in common parlance, a nervous breakdown. Looking backward from that acute episode, we can examine the patient's level of premorbid adjustment, or what is sometimes called premorbid personality. In medicine, the, the term premorbid refers to the patient's status before he or she became ill. And this is another term that's been carried over from medicine into mental health. Individuals with good premorbid personality carry relatively little diathesis or have made a relatively successful adjustment to a relatively high level of diathesis.
Individuals with poor premorbid personality carry relatively high amounts of diathesis or have made a relatively unsuccessful adjustment to a relatively low level of diathesis. Again, when the stress arrives, it's going to precipitate an acute episode of mental illness, but it's only going to do so in individuals who are vulnerable, either by virtue of carrying a relatively high level of the diathesis factor or because they've made a relatively poor premorbid adjustment to their diathesis. As you probably already figured out, the diathesis stress model of psychopathology is a special case of the person by situation interaction, where the diathesis is an attribute of the person and stress is an attribute of the environment or the situation. In principle, diathesis and stress factors could combine in a number of ways to precipitate an acute episode of mental illness. In an additive model, diathesis and stress are independent of each other, and the likelihood of an acute episode is simply a function of the sum of the diathesis and stress factors. In a multiplicative model, diathesis and stress truly interact, so the combination of the two factors is particularly potent. When stress multiplies with diathesis, the combination of diathesis and stress greatly increases the likelihood of an episode of mental illness. The prevailing view is that the interaction between diathesis and stress is truly multiplicative, not merely additive. For individuals carrying substantial levels of diathesis, relatively little stress would be required to precipitate an acute episode of mental illness and the individual would likely show relatively poor premorbid adjustment even before that episode. On the other hand, catastrophic levels of stress would likely produce an acute episode even in individuals who carry little or no pre-existing diathesis, and who therefore show relatively good levels of premorbid adjustment. If diathesis levels are within normal limits, an acute episode would occur as a function of the stressors in the individual's life. If stressors are within normal limits, an acute episode would occur as a function of the individual's level of pre-existing diathesis. Remember, the diathesis factors are specific to particular forms of mental illness. In theory, some particular diathesis predisposes an individual to schizophrenia, but other diatheses would be relevant to things like depressive disorder, anxiety disorder, and the like. So if stress precipitates an acute ep episode of mental illness, that illness will take a specific form that's determined by the diathesis. Although it's not quite right, for reasons that will become clearer later in this lecture, it's easy to think about the diathesis factor as a genetic predisposition to some form of mental illness. And indeed, twin studies show that, at least for some forms of mental illness, the concordance rate for mental illness is higher in monozygotic twins, identical twins, than it is in dizygotic twins, or fraternal twins. For schizophrenia, if you have an identical twin who has schizophrenia, that more than doubles your risk of having schizophrenia yourself. More than doubles your risk if you have an identical twin with bipolar affective disorder and more than triples your risk if you have an identical twin with unipolar affective disorder. So the fact that monozygotic twins are more concordant for psychopathology than dizygotic twins is, again, prima facie evidence for a genetic contribution to these forms of mental illness. But you'll notice that the MZ concordance rate is far from 100%, far from perfect. The genetic endowment does not cause schizophrenia or affective disorder. Rather, it leaves the individual at risk for these forms of mental illness. The genetic endowment is important, but it's not decisive for mental illness. The fact that genes are not decisive for mental illness is vividly illustrated by the story of the Janained quadruplets, a set of identical quadruplet girls born in 1930. Their parents had a strong history of mental illness themselves, and when the parents could no longer take care of the children, they were brought into a clinic of the National Institute of Mental Health. Now, Janine is not their real name. That's a fictitious name, 
derived from the Greek word for dire birth. The names by which the girls are known are also fictitious, obviously, to protect their privacy. But their names, listed in order of birth, form an acronym for the National Institute of Mental Health. Nora, Iris, Myra, and Hester, NIMH. Each of the Janine quadruplets suffers from schizophrenia. And the fact that they had parents who were mentally ill, and they all suffered from the same mental illness, is consistent with the idea that there's a strong genetic component to schizophrenia. But the specific features of their illnesses differed greatly among the children. Nora, Iris, and Hester became so ill that they had to be hospitalized on at least one occasion. But Myra never became that seriously ill. So the differences in course and outcome of mental illness suggest that, despite whatever role the genetic predisposition plays, the genes are not decisive. And in fact, David Rosenthal, who edited a book on the Janine quadruplets, specifically proposed that the outcome in each of the four cases represented a unique interaction of diathesis and stress factors. So what kinds of environmental factors, what kinds of environmental stressors could make a contribution to schizophrenia? If genes are the easiest way to think about the diathesis for schizophrenia, then socioeconomic status, the stress of low SES, is perhaps the easiest way to think about the stress factors. And in fact, socioeconomic status is correlated with schizophrenia. They do tend to go together to some extent. But correlation is not causation. And the fact that schizophrenia is correlated with socioeconomic status does not mean that socioeconomic status caused or contributed to the schizophrenia. The best evidence suggests that the correlation between schizophrenia and socioeconomic status reflects social drift not social genesis. It's not that low socioeconomic status causes schizophrenia, but rather that an episode of schizophrenia can cause an individual to fall or drift from one level of socioeconomic status to a lower level. Still, there are some stressors that have been causally linked to schizophrenia, and these include coping failures, losses and frustrations of various sorts, and family maladjustment. Again, think of the Janine quadruplets. It can happen that children who have been identified as at risk for schizophrenia can be adopted into families where there's a fairly high level of mental illness to begin with. You wouldn't think that could happen, but it does. And when children at risk for schizophrenia, so-called probands for schizophrenia, are adopted into families where there's already a fairly high level of mental illness, those children are much more likely to become schizophrenic themselves compared to other probands who are adopted into families that don't have such maladjustment. A nice demonstration of the interaction of diathesis and stress on schizophrenia is provided by the Finnish Adoptive Family Study of Schizophrenia. The subjects in the study were a number of children who were born to women in Finland who had been hospitalized for schizophrenia and then given up for adoption. 183 children, those are the probands, born to 167 women. And there was a control group of children who had been born to women who had been hospitalized for other illnesses, something other than schizophrenia, and who had also been given up for adoption. Through psychological testing, the adoptive families were rated on a scale of communication deviance, basically, how difficult it is to follow and understand a conversation when you're talking to these people. And then the adoptees themselves received testing and were scored on an index of thought disorder, the primary psychological deficit in schizophrenia. So we have some adoptees who were presumably at risk for schizophrenia because they were born to women who had schizophrenia, other adoptees who were presumably at lower risk for schizophrenia, adoptive families assessed for communicative deviance within the family, and then the adoptees themselves, all assessed for evidence of thought disorder. Here are the results of the study. You can see a very clear interaction between genetic risk for schizophrenia 
and communication deviance within the family on thought disorder in the adopted children. High-risk children adopted into families where there were low levels of communication deviance didn't show much evidence of thought disorder. But high-risk children who were adopted into families where there were high levels of communication deviance showed high levels of thought disorder. For control children who were not particularly at risk for schizophrenia, the amount of communication deviance in the family didn't make any difference. Notice, too, that none of the families of the control children achieved really, really high scores for communication deviance, scores of 9 or 10, whereas such scores were achieved by families who had the high-risk children adopted into them. So apparently, communication deviance interacts with genetic risks to produce thought disorder, an index of psychological deficit in schizophrenia, among these high-risk adoptees. But the high level of thought disorder in these adoptees appears to actually contribute to an increase in communication deviance within the family. So the family environment has an effect on the high-risk child, but the high-risk child also has an effect on the family environment. We see a nice example of reciprocal determinism here. The interaction of a biological diathesis with environmental stressors can also be illustrated by two studies by Avshalom Caspi, Terry Moffat, and their associates based on data collected in what's known as the Dunedin Multidisciplinary Health and Development Study. In this project, which was conducted in New Zealand, longitudinal data was collected from a group of more than 1,000 children, roughly half of them males, in New Zealand, and tested approximately every two or three years from ages 3 to 26. And actually, this group is still being followed. In one study, Caspi and his colleagues examined the role played in adolescent conduct disorder by a specific gene known as the MAOA gene. This gene, located on the X chromosome, promotes monoamine oxidase A, a substance that metabolizes many different neurotransmitters and which has been linked to high levels of aggressiveness in both laboratory mice and humans. Adolescent conduct disorder is characterized by high levels of aggressive and antisocial behavior, and so it made sense to them that the MAOA gene might be involved. But Caspi and his colleagues also explored the role of stress in conduct disorder, particularly a history of childhood and adolescent maltreatment, which some theorists have proposed initiates an intergenerational vicious cycle of violence, in which maltreated boys become maltreating fathers, producing maltreated boys who will also become maltreating fathers. In fact, subjects with high levels of MAOA activity showed relatively low incidence of conduct disorder regardless of their history of maltreatment. But subjects with low levels of MAOA activity, who also had a history of severe maltreatment, showed a very high incidence of conduct disorder. Apparently, this MAOA gene is a diathesis which interacts with severe maltreatment to produce conduct disorder in these boys. The MAOA gene is not by itself sufficient, nor, for that matter, is a history of maltreatment. It's the interaction of the genetic diathesis and the environmental stress that does the work. In a similar study, Caspi and his colleagues examined the role of another gene, known as the 5-HTT gene in major depressive disorder. The 5-HTT gene, located on chromosome 17, comes in two forms, short and long. Those are short and long alleles of the gene, yielding four genotypes, two short alleles, a short and a long allele, a long and a short allele, or two long alleles. This 5-HTT gene is of interest because it's a serotonin transporter, and we believe that serotonin is linked to depression in humans, not least because there are certain drugs, known as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, that act on the serotonin system. Prozac and Zoloft, for example. These are popular drug treatments for major depressive disorder. <laughs> 
Caspi et al. also explored the role of life stress in depression by counting the number of stressful events occurring in the life of each subject between ages 21 and 26. In psychology, a stressful event can involve lots of different things. Getting divorced, a death in the family, but also getting married and having a birth in the family. It's all stress. Subjects with the long form of the 5-HTT genotype, that is, two long alleles, showed a relatively low incidence of depression regardless of their history of stress. However, subjects with the short form of the genotype, with at least one short allele, SS, SL, or LS, combined with a history of many stressful events during the previous five years, showed a much higher incidence of depression. Again, the 5-HTT genotype did not cause depression, nor did exposure to lots of stress. It was the combination that precipitated the episode of depression, the combination of genetic diathesis and environmental stress. Here is one more example from the caspi moffett group. It's long been known that some people who smoked marijuana as adolescents develop a form of psychosis as adults, but the precise pathway has been unclear. Certainly, most adolescents who smoke marijuana don't develop psychosis, but it does appear to be a risk factor. Caspi and his colleagues focused their attention on yet another gene, known as COMT, located on chromosome 22. COMT is involved in the metabolism of dopamine, which has been linked to schizophrenia. The gene comes in two forms, methionine, met, and valine, val. Individuals who have two copies of the met allele show the fastest breakdown of dopamine, those with two copies of val the slowest, and those with one of each somewhere in between. So if you're a met-met person, dopamine metabolizes faster and resides in your system for less time. Again, using subjects from the Dunedin study, Caspi and his colleagues classified their subjects according to the form of the COMT gene and also by their history of adolescent marijuana use. And when they looked at the incidence of psychotic symptoms in these subjects when they were young adults, they found a clear gene-by-environment interaction. The affected subjects didn't always show full-blown schizophrenia or any other psychotic syndrome. Still, their risk for delusions, hallucinations, and other schizophreniform symptoms was greatly increased if they had two copies of the VAL allele, coupled with frequent marijuana use as adolescents. If they had only one copy of VAL, or two copies of MET, their risk was greatly reduced. The gene-by-environment interaction and depression involving the 5-HTT gene has stimulated a great deal of interest, but it's also been controversial. Some researchers have failed to replicate Caspi's findings, while some critics have complained about the assessment of stress. Katya Karg and her colleagues recently surveyed 56 studies involving more than 40,000 subjects and found that, overall, these studies confirmed the G by E effect. A history of stress, especially defined by childhood maltreatment or life-threatening or chronic medical conditions, coupled with the short form of the 5-HTT gene, greatly increases one's risk for a major depressive episode. Okay, so let's now take a breath for a minute and review where we are. We've seen a number of examples of diathesis and stress in a variety of different psychiatric syndromes. First, at least for schizophrenia and for unipolar affective disorder, we've seen that the concordance rate is higher for monozygotic twins than for dizygotic twins, which is strongly su suggestive of a genetic diathesis. But for both of these conditions, the concordance rate for monozygotic twins is low enough that it's very clear that genes are not decisive and that a fair amount of the action rests with the non-shared environment. We don't have a clear sense of what those environmental factors are in the case of unipolar affective disorder. But in the case of schizophrenia, it seems very clear that exposure of an at-risk child to a family characterized by lots of communication deviance can increase the levels of thought disorder in the child. 
In adolescent conduct disorder, we've seen how levels of MAOA activity, which are presumably under genetic control, interact with a history of maltreatment. In depression, we see how the 5-HTT gene interacts with stressful events. And in drug-related psychosis, we've seen how the COMT gene interacts with marijuana use. So in each case, we see a clear interaction of biological genetic diathesis with some aspect of environment. This is exactly the kind of pattern that we'd expect to see given the diathesis stress framework for understanding the etiology of mental illness. The interaction of diathesis and stress can also be seen in the case of psychosomatic ulcers. As I indicated earlier, it's long been popular to view ulcers as caused by psychological stress. Stress activates the sympathetic branch of the autonomic nervous system, preparing the body for flight or fight, tend and befriend. The sympathetic nervous system activity depletes bodily resources. The parasympathetic nervous system kicks in to try to restore those resources. One way it does that is to digest food and provide new blood sugar. So it secretes gastric acid into the stomach. There's no food there because the person's under stress and not eating, and the gastric acid eats away at the lining of the gastrointestinal organs, creating ulcers. That's the theory. Unfortunately for theory, in 1984, two Australian physicians, Marshall and Warren, identified the role of a specific bacterium, Helicobacter pylori, or H. pylori, in gastritis and peptic ulcers. This is a discovery that got them the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 2005. Their findings suggested that the cause of ulcers was not stress after all, but rather a simple bacterial infection. In fact, this discovery led a leading molecular neuropsychiatrist to write an essay entitled Another One Bites the Dust, celebrating the triumph of biomedicine over psychology. But, as it turns out, while antibodies for H. pylori are found in over 90% of ulcer patients, they're also found in almost 80% of patients who are ulcer-free, indicating that other factors, in addition to H. pylori infection, play an important role in the development of peptic ulcers. We now have good reason to believe that some of these factors are in fact psychosocial and that stress interacts with H. pylori infection to create ulcers. Animal research by Bruce Overmeyer and his colleagues exposed rats who were infected with H. pylori to a regime of unpredictable and uncontrollable shock. Overmeyer himself was involved in some of the earliest experiments on learned helplessness. Ulcers tended not to occur in infected animals unless they were exposed to unpredictable and uncontrollable shocks, an environment of helplessness. Animals who were exposed to learned helplessness, unpredictable and uncontrollable shocks, tended not to develop ulcers unless they were infected by H. pylori. So neither H. pylori infection nor stress is by itself the cause of ulcers. It's the interaction of a bacterial infection with H. pylori and environmental stress, unpredictable and uncontrollable aversive events. What's true for rats in this laboratory model is probably true for humans as well. Here's another example of biological diathesis and environmental stress at work. You'll remember that fear conditioning has long served as a kind of laboratory model for the development of phobias. Phobias are abnormal, maladaptive fear responses, and it seems reasonable to suggest that at the heart of phobias is some kind of untoward encounter with the object of the phobia. Phobias, on this view, are purely psychogenic in nature. They arise from the phobic patient's past experience. It's a very nice story, but it's got two serious problems. The first of these is that phobic patients do not always have a positive history of negative encounters with the object of their phobia. How many people with a snake phobia have actually been bitten by a snake, or even seen one outside the confines of the reptile house at the zoo? Moreover, phobias are not arbitrary. If phobias were just a product of fear conditioning, we'd have phobias for lots of different things. And yes, the list of phobias is fairly long, 
Almost any noun can have the suffix phobia attached to it. But when you look at the kinds of phobias we actually encounter in the clinic, we see that they're for a restricted set of things. Fear of spiders, snakes, and other creepy crawlies. Fear of the dark. Fear of heights and of open spaces. Fear of the gaze of others. Most cases of phobia are accounted for by a relatively small set of phobic objects. So let's take these problems one at a time. If phobias are a product of learning, how can you have a phobia in someone who hasn't had a learning experience, a direct encounter with the object of the phobia? Well, that answer comes in large part from work that I described much earlier in the course on the social learning of fear in monkeys, work by Susan Meinecke. You'll recall that she demonstrated observational fear conditioning. Monkeys, it turns out, are not naturally afraid of snakes, but they can acquire that fear by being exposed to another monkey who is afraid of snakes. Observing another monkey react fearfully in the presence of a snake will lead a naive monkey to acquire the fear of snakes as well. There is no direct experience here, but the fear is acquired through observational learning. And there's no reason to think that phobias can't be acquired exactly the same way, vicariously, by observing other people who have the same phobia. Now you'll also remember that in the Meinecke experiments, the monkey showed observational fear conditioning to snakes, but not to flowers. Monkeys who observed another monkey acting fearfully in the presence of a snake acquired a snake fear themselves. But monkeys who observed another monkey acting fearfully in the presence of flowers didn't acquire a fear of flowers. And that brings us to the second problem, the problem that phobias are not arbitrary. Again, you'll remember from our discussion of learning that Martin Seligman proposed an argument about preparedness in learning. By virtue of our evolutionary history, each species is prepared to acquire some stimulus response associations very readily. While some associations are unprepared, they can be acquired but the animal isn't predisposed by evolution to form them. And still other associations are contra-prepared. Again, by virtue of their evolutionary history, some species simply can't acquire certain stimul stimulus response associations. So, perhaps in much the same way that rhesus monkeys are prepared to acquire a fear of snakes, so we humans have been prepared by our evolution to acquire fear of the dark, fear of heights, fear of open spaces, fear of certain animals, with very little direct exposure, maybe none, just vicarious exposure. In this case, the learning experience, whether it's direct experience or vicarious experience, serves as the stress element in diathesis stress theory. But the evolved predisposition to become afraid of things like dark and height and open spaces and snakes and spiders that functions as a kind of diathesis. It sets the stage. It renders us vulnerable to acquiring these fear responses, including the pathological fears that constitute our phobias. Now, so far, we've characterized the diathesis factor as biological in nature, a genetic predisposition, a bacterial infection, or an evolved preparedness to form certain kinds of associations. And I've characterized the stress factor as environmental or psychological in nature. Exposure to communication deviants, a history of maltreatment, psychological stress, lack of social support, unpredictable and uncontrollable events, fear conditioning, whether through direct experience or vicarious experience. But it would be a mistake to identify diathesis with biology and stress with the environment not least because there are some stressors which are really biological in nature. For example, adults with schizophrenia often have a history of prenatal and perinatal complications. That is, they were products of a difficult pregnancy or a difficult birth. These events constitute stressors, but they're really not environmental stressors in the same sense that we've been using this term. They're biological stressors. By themselves, they're not enough to cause schizophrenia. There are plenty of people walking this earth who are the products of difficult pregnancies and difficult births. But these kinds of biological factors can interact with a genetic diathesis to lead an individual to develop schizophrenia 
as an adult. So the stress factors implicated in the diathesis stress model can be biological in nature. And it turns out that the diathesis factors, for their part, can be psychological in nature. A good example of this can be found in the cognitive theory of depression proposed by Aaron Beck, known to his friends and colleagues as Tim Beck, in 1967. Based on his clinical observations, Beck argued that depressed patients are characterized by a particular pattern of thinking which he called depressogenic schemata. You'll remember from our lectures on perception and memory that a schema is an organized cognitive framework for perception and memory. Combined with information supplied by the stimulus, it allows us to make inferences about what's out there in the environment. Combined with information supplied by the memory trace, it allows us to make inferences about what happened in the past. Beck identified three ways of thinking, three depressogenic schemata that he argued a lot of depressed patients shared in common. A negative view of themselves, a negative view of the world, and a negative view of the future. The person says to himself, basically, I'm no good, the world is hostile, and the future is bleak. Now, being depressed might cause you to have these thoughts, but that wasn't Beck's idea. Remember, he's calling them depressogenic schemata, schemata that give rise to depression. So here we have a pattern of thinking, a mode of thought characterized by these depressogenic schemata, which comprise a kind of cognitive predisposition to become depressed when something bad actually does happen to you. An environmental stressor, some negative events, interacts with a cognitive diathesis, a psychological diathesis, a particular way of viewing oneself and other people and the future to precipitate an episode of depression. A different though related theory of depression offers another view of psychological diathesis predisposing people to become depressed. This is the hopelessness theory of depression proposed by Lynn Abramson, Lauren Alloy, and their colleagues. It's an extension of the learned helplessness theory of depression originally proposed by Martin Seligman, and Abramson and Alloy were both students of Seligman's. Seligman, whom you'll remember from the learned helplessness experiments that we discussed in the lectures on learning, proposed that learned helplessness might be a cause of depression, that people became depressed precisely because they were exposed to an environment that presented them with a lot of unpredictable and uncontrollable aversive events. It's a good idea. Such an environment would make you depressed. But Abramson and Alloy noticed that not everybody who was exposed to such an environment became depressed. Some of them became angry. What made the difference, in their view, was that the people who became depressed approached the world with a particular kind of attributional style, which was depressogenic. Now, in social psychology, causal attribution has to do with the way people explain the causes of events. Suppose you get a bad score on an exam. You can explain that in a number of different ways. For example, you might explain your failure in terms of some stable cause. I'm just not smart enough to do this work. Or in terms of a variable cause. I didn't study hard enough. Those are both internal causes. The attribution is made to something about you. But there can also be external attributions to something about the world outside. You failed the test because the teacher is mean, or because the test was tricky, or because the test was too hard. It doesn't have anything to do with you. It has to do with something else. So causal attributions could be made to stable factors or variable factors, internal factors or external factors. They could also be made to global factors or specific factors. You could say, oh, I failed the test because I'm just not very smart, implying that you're not smart about anything. Or you could say, you know, I'm not very good at this particular thing. I'm going to study something else where I could do better on the test. Abramson and Alloy proposed that people become depressed when they're exposed to unpredictable and uncontrollable aversive events, as Seligman argued, but only when they view those events through a particular cognitive lens, only when they tend to explain those events in a particular way. This attributional style they characterized as stable, internal, and global. 
Some negative thing happens, the person tries to understand why, and he says to himself, it's because of me. I'm always responsible for all of the bad things that happen to me. An internal, stable, global attribution concerning negative events. And if you're going to make an attribution like that, you're going to get depressed. So here, there's an environmental stressor, an environment that consists of uncontrollable aversive events, but that interacts with a psychological diathesis, a tendency to explain things in a particular way, a depressogenic attributional style. So the diathesis factor is probably usually biological in nature, and the stress factor is usually psychosocial in nature, but it doesn't have to be that way. Consider how a reversal of the standard account of diathesis and stress might help explain the incidence of things like postpartum depression, which occurs in some, but not all, women who have recently given birth. Some women also become depressed during pregnancy, and others become depressed after they've experienced menopause. All of these events, pregnancy, parturition, and menopause, are associated with fairly sudden biochemical changes, big changes in hormone levels that may alter the person's characteristic mood states and activity levels. So here we have a biological stressor, sudden changes in the individual's hormonal environment that has certain behavioral consequences like altered mood state and reduction in activity level. But now we want to ask, what's the person to make of these changes? And how the person reacts to these biological changes is going to be determined in large part by how she views them or interprets them. If these biochemical events and the psychological changes they instigate are interpreted in terms of Beck's depressogenic schemata or Abramson and Alloy's depressive attributional style, they may well be interpreted in such a manner as to precipitate an episode of depression. So in this case, we might have a clearly biological stressor, changes in the hormonal environment, and a diathesis factor that is clearly psychological in nature, a depressogenic way of thinking. Women don't become depressed simply because they experience sudden changes in their hormonal environment, but they might very well become depressed if this biological stressor interacts with this particular psychological diathesis. The stressful events are biochemical in nature, and the diathesis is psychological in nature. Now, I hasten to add that this is pure speculation on my part. It's meant merely to illustrate how we can use the diathesis stress framework to think about the origins of mental illness. So the diathesis is often biological, and the stress is often psychosocial in nature, but it doesn't have to be that way. The really important feature of diathesis is that it's something that the person carries with him or her into a situation, either as a biological trait or as a psychosocial trait. By the same token, the really important feature of stress is that it's something that happens to the person in a particular situation, either as a biological event or a psychosocial event, or for that matter, a series of events. The diathesis stress theory of mental illness is just another illustration of the doctrine of interactionism. Episodes of mental illness reflect the interaction of the person and the environment. The diathesis, whether it's biological or psychosocial in nature, is a characteristic of the person. It's something that the person carries around with him or herself. The stressor, whether it's biological or psychosocial in nature, is something that happens to the person. So, in the same way that normal experience, thought, and action emerge from the interaction of the person and the situation, so do episodes of mental illness emerge from the interaction of personal diathesis and environmental stress.